Well, we've seen the film. Yes. And it is, was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana. <laughs> as Jacqueline Sullivan said earlier today, uh, it is so rooted in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania, midway between Scranton and Harrisburg, and it deals with issues that are national, even international in scope. So let me begin by asking you, Maria, what's your reaction? Well, I think uh, a couple things. First off, um, the last um, scenes in which um, talks about uh, going to try to better your life. That understanding uh, it was so critical. Um, and so many, so many people don't understand that that is a worldwide phenomenon. And that human spirit is just going to drive people to risk, risk so much. But the other thing that um, came through very much is, is the anxiety and fear of the people in Shenandoah. Um, their dreams and their expectations of what life, what their dreams were for their children and the fact that it's so economically depressed. And unfortunately, as history has shown over and over again, fear and anxiety strikes a chord too often in us that leads us to lash out to the stranger among us. Uh, and that, that we just have to constantly be reminded. And the last thing I would say is I really like the really understanding that this town had been uh, home to immigrant waves before, right? And I think one of the things that we forget, even uh, sometimes in our effort to embrace this sense of American, or, is we are tribal. We, as human beings, we sort of form a tribe. And often we have to figure out, well, how do we make sure that tribe is, includes and is respectful of others who are different from us? And, it, and, uh, and, and clearly, they had suffered discrimination, the Italians, the Polish, and yet somehow they couldn't expand. So I'll, I'll stop there, but it was incredibly powerful, and, and, uh, and congratulations. I'd like to applaud her, what she just said. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. David, I introduced you earlier. I mentioned that you have photographed wars and horrific conflicts for 30 years around the world. What made you do this film? Well, thank you, Harley. First of all, I am absolutely delighted to be here. Um, where is here? Here is Berkeley, California. Um, <laughs> and want to particularly thank Harley Shaken and the, I'm probably not gonna get this wrong, the Latin American Studies Center? Yes, that's perfect. Um, <laughs> for bringing me here. Um, I couldn't be more proud to be at the University of Berkeley in California in our country. It's always been a place that inspired um, me, my family, I think many people in America um, in terms of um, the legacy and the tradition of, um, of what? Of activism. I guess I should just say, call it that. Of <laughs> activism that's been so much a part of this community and the legacy of this university. So I'm ecstatic to be here, so thank you. So where did this all come from? Gosh, um, I think it came from you know, I could go on for a really long time on this, so let me think how to start in ways that are useful to any of you. So I was, I'm 57 years old. It means that I was born in 55. It means that um, John F. Kennedy was assassinated when I was in the third grade. It means that Dr. King was assassinated when I was 13 years old. In the particular family that I come from, in a, from an industrial town in America, when Dr. King was assassinated, um, in 1968, my three brothers and sisters and I were at a movie theater, and my parents came and got us and, and took us home. And when we got home, um, my mother said, we didn't come to get you tonight because we were worried about what might happen to you. We came to get you because we feel like somebody in our own family was killed tonight. And that's the kind of family that I came from. 
um, and Dr. King's thought that we're all created equal is um, what I was raised with at the dinner table. The truth is that um, having been so raised with that idea and so much a believer uh, of, the, of what that idea means in terms of um, the kind of world we might be able to live in, I was always very confused living in a place like Fort Wayne, Indiana, because it was not equal. It was very much back in the 1960s, 70s, and probably to some extent still is today as an industrial city in the, in the Midwest. It was very much a black inner city or poor white Hispanic Appalachian inner city and then sort of everybody else, which happened to be white and certainly middle class or middle upper class. And it wasn't until I, I grew up, um, I have an identical twin brother, and I grew up thinking that, um, interestingly, given the, the subject of the film, uh, my grandfather had been a, an extraordinarily athlete, uh, athlete and he'd, he'd play pro sports. My father was an extraordinary athlete. I grew up playing uh, really serious football and thought that I was going to be a pro football player. Um, reality struck when I got to be about 18 years old, and those illusions of grandeur sort of were dismissed. But um, what actually happened is that my brother tore up a knee in a football injury, and my dad in the hospital gave him a camera and a book of photographs. Um, and the first thing that my brother did with now this free time on his hands is take the camera and go into the inner city of our hometown and start to photograph the lives of our black teammates who were our friends, but who would always get on a bus and at about seven in the evening after football practice and go back to the inner city and we never saw them and they never saw us after about that point in time. And, and he started coming home with these photographs um, in the lives of, of our teammates' families' lives. And I was just knocked over. I used to see photographers on the sidelines at football games and I used to think, why don't these guys want to play? It's kind of sad, they're just standing there. And all of a sudden my brother's bringing home these photographs and in these photographs, it, it, I, I cry every time I speak about this because what I saw in these photographs was finally what made sense to me that what is equal is human dignity and that's something that you're not, you're, that's something that you can't buy and no one can ever take away from you and it doesn't matter how much money your father has, it doesn't ma matter how many diplomas you have, it, nothing matters. Dignity is something in each and every one of us and I started to see that in his photographs. And at that point, um, I sort of never looked back at what I've been doing with my life. And that means I've really been a photographer around the world and now more recently a documentary filmmaker. So having said all of that, um, from the time I was very young, so let's go back to the Vietnam War. I was too young to go to the Vietnam War, but my older brother was susceptible to draft. He was actually went to Harvard in 1968. I was telling Harley today, my family would get all excited when he would call to say, you know, to, to speak to my parents, and we'd all rush the phone, and my parents would say, Billy, how's class? And he'd say, well, actually, Mom and Dad, I haven't gone to class the whole semester. We're in the, we're in the streets protesting the Vietnam War, and I just got my head split open by a billy club. And, um, and the truth is that America at that time had a, a conscription that meant everyone was susceptible and, and vulnerable to the draft. Although there were caveats, students, university students got um, a certain exemption from the draft for a certain amount of time. And so I started to recognize already as I was relatively young in a working class town that the working class was already bearing the brunt of fighting America's wars. And that's certainly true today. I've been now a war photographer in every imaginable war zone since Vietnam and certainly every war zone that Americans have gone to fight. And proportionally and certainly by and large, the soldiers that fight American wars today are, come from working class communities like Shenandoah because that's, that's effectively employment. Um, and in, as such, I have a certain amount of, I've always had a certain amount of respect for the working class. I've always had a respect for the values of an immigrant nation. I mean, I was always really proud of that. I was, you know, from the time I was a little kid, like the rest of us, don't they tell us that? You know, don't we have to stand in front of flags and things and, and, ex and, and get excited and proud and pump our chests out of the fact that we are, in fact, an immigrant nation? Um, but that's real for me. I, I love that. I, 
So when I went to Shenandoah, Pennsylvania, interestingly enough, it was, it was actually on the heels of Barack Obama saying that in times of crisis, the working class in Pennsylvania cling to guns and religion as he was trying to get elected in 2008. And the pundit said, we well, just lost the election because you just pissed off the white working class in Pennsylvania. You can't win an election without the white working class in Pennsylvania. I thought, well, here we go again. He's parading, and I was very excited by a vision of one America, but in fact, there are all these different Americas. And I thought it's time to go to a working class town, and, and I was always excited to know what life was like in a coal mining town, and I headed to the coal region not knowing that I was going to land in a town that four star football players in an immigrant town had just beaten to death an undocumented Mexican immigrant. So it really was, you were focused on the working class, and and uh, a coal town that was yeah. really had seen its best days and walked into the story. Yes. Well, I was struck by the nation of immigrants because one of the things that I teach is immigration law, and I'm constantly trying to remind our students that we say that is our national myth, right? And yet, we've always, always meant, uh, met, uh, no one was met with open arms, right. truly. And, um, and this notion of you know, all the different Americas, so one of the things I always point out is even when the country was being formed, um, there's a second Federalist paper where John Jay um, was very anti-Catholic, but what he writes uh, is, is says something like, Providence has been so good to give this bountiful land to a, a people that share the same religion, the same language, the same values, and the point is, when he wrote that in the late 1700s, it was a lie. Mm -hmm. It already America had right. different religions and had different faiths, and so we've constantly been right. trying to. Okay, we all fit in this box, right. but Maria is so right, obviously, and 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 can speak to so many of the details of our immigration legacy much more poignantly and articulately than I'm sure I can. However, having been in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania, I did learn things that were absolutely fascinating. Um, and you're so absolutely right about the iterations of immigration from the early 1800s in a coal mining town that was sitting on top of the most important reserve of coal in the world that effectively fueled the Industrial Revolution in this country. But the first people that came over were the coal barons who were English. And then they brought over Irish and Welsh who were the coal miners for English coal barons in England, in which there was already a master-servant relationship. And that was Im completely imported to Shenandoah, Pennsylvania. Um, when they decided, well, actually, let me rephrase. They were actually pretty, this is a, an interesting nuance. It's not in the film. When they, because language becomes, as you probably followed in the film, actually very important yeah. as, a, as a dynamic of prejudice or of otherness. Um, and cleverly, the early coal miners, when they, um, so when you're, in a, when you're working in a coal mine, you are either a coal miner, which means you work with explosives, or you're a buddy that works for a coal miner. You're effectively a contracted laborer. So most of the men who actually worked in the mines were not coal miners, they were, they were contracted laborers for coal miners. And able, in order to get the status of a coal miner, you have to pass an extremely challenging exam, which is in English. And it was, and it was put together in, in difficult English with the absolute agenda of keeping the coal mining status amidst English-speaking people. Mm -hmm. That is interesting. I, I think, Marie, what you mentioned about immigration, and David, what you said earlier about how you got to make the film, really, I think you see it, you sense it. There's a feeling of respect for the people of the town, and what makes the film, to me, so troubling and so moving uh, is the fact that if it's unspeakable, horrific acts committed by evil people, that's easy. Right. Uh, but there are some very decent people. There are some ordinary people who get sucked into something, and the acts are horrific and unspeakable, and there's a subtext where Scully, Brian Scully, uh, mentions at one point, I didn't think Luis Ramirez was a person. Mm -hmm. So when he ceased to be a person, right. and him ceasing to be a person didn't simply occur in Shenandoah, right. Shenandoah, it reflects a broader way. 
in which these issues have been discussed and questions about immigration have been dealt with over many, many years. Well, I couldn't agree more. And, and what got me so excited by what Maria was talking about so fundamentally is one of those things that I think we don't talk about particularly well. And I don't think we talk about it as a part of our teaching. I don't think we talk about it as our as, our, as a part of our raising children necessarily. I think most people actually try to do a pretty good job at raising children. I think that's, so I don't have any, any sort of, you know, ax to grind about human instinct. I think most people want, want good lives for their children. Um, but I think one of the things that probably along the way, just in the course of survival, if you will, that I think has been dismissed, and certainly as our society has evolved, um, in which survival isn't necessarily for so many of us necessarily at stake on a day-to-day -day basis. It is for some, but not for many in this country. But one of the things that's been dismissed is the, the conversation and the thinking around what each of us do with fear. And fear is in all of us, and it's, it's an interesting, you know, I'm a war photographer, so along the way I had to figure out, at least in terms of going to war zones, what I would do with fear. Because when you go into the theater of war in any war zone in the world, you are absolutely vulnerable to being hurt, injured, or killed. There's just no way around that. I had to come up with a real clear sense of my own purpose and mission and motivation in order to transcend the fears that were real about going to war zones. And that was probably, but I think going back to the time I was already as I told you when I fell into photography when I was about 17, I realized that if, if I actually believed that what was equal was dignity, then the only way that I could actually pursue the process of, of responding to that conviction with, photo, with, conviction with photographs was if I would go into people's lives that I didn't know. And that meant on a, almost an everyday basis, and it's now been almost 35 years, it has meant that almost on an everyday basis, I have to wake up in the morning and I have, to, I have to get myself together and I have to consider my fears and I have to make an, one active step over a divide. And that divide is usually a divide between, it has sort of played out mostly in terms of people of different ethnicities, different races, sometimes different genders, different sexualities, different nationalities. But it's a daily process that I involve myself with. And I, I found myself about a month ago talking to an audience, and I'd never really spoken about this. And I looked at the audience and I said, you know, what I propose, because I don't propose to know anything. I don't certainly propose to know everything. But in my humble way, I realized that, that I wanted to just get people excited by it, is if you actually just take a baby step every day of waking up and sort of thinking through and confronting your own fear, and you literally just take one step over a divide that has separated you from something or somebody that's been fearful for you, before long, your arms actually start to grow wings and you start to levitate and you actually start to fly. Okay. With that, we're gonna open it up to questions. I just ask that you be brief. Yes. in the film and whether football, the, the culture of this town of guys beating each other up uh, had anything to do with the message of anti-immigrant uh, yeah. and anti... Uh, so I've been asked that many times and I've had to really think about it. So I thought about it a lot as I was actually making the film. I, as I told you, I played a lot of football and I was always stirred by all kinds of feelings playing football. There was never one set of things. I think what I liked about football playing when I was growing up was that I was never particularly big and that I realized that what I had inside of me was, was my own self-determination and I could usually hit a guy that was twice as big as me, harder than he could hit me if I was driven to do so. I'm not suggesting that's a way to live your life, but that's how I felt. <laughs> Um, I also liked the idea that there was a certain fl fair play in football, that there was a referee and you could only hit someone from the front. You couldn't hit them from behind. That's called a clip. And if you clip somebody, which is a cheap shot, you get a yellow flag and it's a 15-yard penalty. I always liked that about football. But there were other things that I didn't like growing up. And as I was filming, 
some of the things that started to come up for me was at some fundamental level also this whole notion of what does it mean to be tough. And as you probably noticed in the film, it became pretty evident to me that in that town, the real tough people are the women. And it also started to make me think a lot about the whole idea, and you said it really well, Maria, that's why I wanted to applaud you. You said it so much in just a very brief introduction. The other thing that was very much stirred in me and, and something that continues to challenge me, really, and I think it might want to challenge all of us to think about this, but I think there is probably a very natural instinct, and I've talked to child psychiatrists and child development people about this. There's a natural instinct for children at a very early age to, gravi to, to gravitate towards an, a, sense, a sensation of alliance, and that can, that can be created by a sensation of family, by school, by community, by religion, by nationality, by team. And I think most of us will acknowledge that being a part of a team is a really exciting and amazing feeling. I don't think any of us are here to necessarily just scream and say that's something that we shouldn't embrace. I think it's something we, I think it's something that feels really great. But when you see that, the manifestation of that feeling then become one of exclusion. And I think it runs the risk of that in our society all the time as I think about it. Then I think it becomes something we actually have to think about together and we have to talk about. All of you, some of you are too young, thankfully, um, in the audience, but many of you have gone to sports bars in our country and you see people going nuts over the team they're rooting for. And it actually becomes almost you know, blood war at, at times. And even when you start to hear the language that people use in, in what they you know, might think of as actually just sort of very fun, um, convivial, spirited ways, the language can get not unlike the language you heard in this film. And, it does start to create some probably really problematic dynamics. And that in some respects, in probably for me, my most concerning way gets manifest, manifest in this thing that we're also taught um, as, a, as a value in our society, which is patriotism. And patriotism is a really tricky thing. Okay. Right. If I could just, uh, not that I'm a football expert at all, but one thing I've been, done a lot of thinking about uh, came from a book I read. Um, was the notion, because the role of football in this small town is huge, right? And it was a book by Neil Stevenson, um, and he had a line which I, it really rang true to me, which is, think about um, the lives of most working people. You know, some of us are very lucky to have jobs we love, but a lot of us don't. And what allows you to sort of get up every morning and grind your way out and come home? Well, sports and religion become a way of giving some context and, and dare I say, meaning. It just gives you, some, it gives you a story that's somehow more interesting than your own because what you're doing in that factory or you know, picking those strawberries or whatever, you know, those really, really hard jobs is it's to humanize it. And you, you really have a lot of your dignity pulled out. And so I, you know, I, and I uh, uh, was once a sports fan, uh, certainly watch enough <laughs> soccer for my girl, but I'm sort of struck by that role, especially in America, the politics, but then you know, soccer in other countries. I mean, yeah, and I'm not smart enough to know how to really dig into what I'm about to say, but I think it's more than just football, and I think, it's, I think it also gets down to the whole notion of winners and losers, and you don't have to look beyond our American stock market to see that there are winners and losers at the people who play the American stock market. So we may, we may think very distinctly of the stock market than the game of football, but I'm not so sure it's all that different, really. Yes. So I was, I was struck that the, um, thank you by the way, it's a great, really powerful film. I was struck that the whole town is Catholic and clearly many of the immigrants coming in are also Catholic. I'm wondering what role that institution played in the town in this crisis. And similarly, it must have been a union town at some point, the yes. United Mine Workers, and maybe it's not now because the mine's closed and some of the factories aren't, but w were there institutions besides the schools and the police involved at all in this, in this crisis? Well, interesting question. Um, there was a priest, and he's not in the film, that played 
um, a minor role at an early stage. Um, in fact, I think you saw him in the film at, at a gathering, um, a vigil. Um, but I would say that the church played an extremely minor role in the community. As you point out, um, you know, nevertheless, that Catholicism was interestingly the one unifying thread in all of the various immigrants, immigrant groups in Shenandoah today. Um, certainly that unified Mexicans, at least theoretically, with, every, with so many of the other immigrant groups. Um, the churches are still to this point mostly in terms of the, the various Catholic churches in Shenandoah. There's a, there's a church where Mexicans go, but it's not for the most part where other people in the town go. Um, that may be changing a little bit right now. The, what you pointed out about the town having been a union town is certainly true. I mean, it's not, it wasn't just a union town. I mean, so many things came together in this one place that I landed in that became remarkable. It was a town actually that very much um, helped give birth to the American Union Movement um, back in the early 1900s. It was one of the, the great coal mining strikes of all time that happened in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania in which the National Guard was sent in by the American president at that time in 1902 because um, mine workers were organizing and the, and the coal barons were, were trying to break the union. Um, when I got to town, the thing that was most interesting to me, I was telling somebody today, you know, I'd really gone at a time when I was excited about Barack Obama getting elected. And one of the things that I was, one of the criteria that probably, um, would have made a different decision in my own mind about whether this was a town before I knew even you know anything about this incident that would have made it would have helped me make a decision about whether this was a town where I was going to spend a year of my life it ended up being five years was whether there was going to be whether I could experience in this town a diversity in a variety of ways but certainly in terms of who was going to who people were going to vote for and as I pulled up in front of the donut shop in that town, the very first minute I arrived in Shenandoah, I got out of my car and there were six men sitting in, in lawn chairs in front of the donut shop and I approached them. And after introducing myself and a little bit my background, I think one of my first questions was, you know, who are you guys voting for? And within a minute, there were three who were voting for Obama and three who couldn't stand him. And I thought, all right, this is good. I can work with this. <laughs> Um, and, the, and, and what was really interesting, and I'm just going to say this because I don't want to take too much time always, but what people would say very candidly is, you know, this has historically been a democratic town because we're, we're workers and we, we've always been, you know, a union town. Um, but many would say, you know, we're faced with a real challenge. And this was, again, was uh, 2008. We've never pulled a lever in a voting booth for a Republican, but we've also never pulled a lever for a black man. Yeah. And so which is going to be harder? Well, the town narrowly voted for Obama, actually, in 2008. Yes. Um, um, uh, could you say something about your trip to Mexico? And I'm especially curious as to what the people there thought about, if you know, about what had happened to Luis. What do they know about Shenandoah? What, what were they thinking? Beyond the family, obviously, yeah. in terrific uh, grief. but. Yeah. The town more generally. Thank you. So Iramoco in the state of Guanajuato is on an enormous lagoon and it's, um, as the movie suggests, its economy is effectively fish. It's a fishing village. Um, it struggles and just about every man and woman over the age of 18 actually goes to America. And the time I actually, when I'd gone down to um, when I was in Mexico, it was at the same time of the fiesta for the Virgin of Guadalupe. And the, so many of these families had just come back from America. And it was thousands of people, um, all who had just come home for a break from America. Um, and they, you know, what they, what I, what I certainly encountered on, a, on an absolutely, you know, per person basis when I would talk to men, particularly some women, um, but when I would talk to them about the realities of their lives, they would look at me and very candidly say, I'm illegal. If that's what you want to call me, it wasn't, these were not my words, um, I'm illegal, but I have to make a living for my family. I don't do this because I want to be illegal. 
I have to, I'm doing this because I have no choice. Um, and I think most of the, you know, I think there was a, um, an incredible sorrow. This is a very, you know, everyone, the grape, the grapevine, I think, throughout probably the Hispanic community, not just in Aramaco, not just in Mexico, but knew about the case with Luis Ramirez. And, um, you know, the other reality, as you'll appreciate, is um, people will tell you so much, but they're also, they're also trying to survive, and, and they're try to, trying to stay under the radar. Um, so what they want to be able to do is, you know, effectively just that. They, they have feelings. They were, um, I think the feelings were most accurately expressed by the different family members, which were effectively, um, I'm sad, I'm in pain, and we don't know what will actually happen because that's out of our control, but God will take care of justice in this eventually. That was sort of the general reaction. And then I think the, you know, the sort of overriding issue was that against um, so many different challenges, people have to survive, and they're doing what they have to do. I don't know if that. I was just curious about uh, any sense about uh, the racism that some of them might have experienced in the United States, or, is, or was, is that the way they interpreted what happened? Oh, I think in, I think, for sure, that's how they interpreted what happened. I'm not sure if there, I don't think one could probably have any other interpretation. But yes, I think, I think everyone felt that. I'd like to slip in a very brief question here to follow up on that. Uh, at one point in the film, uh, Crystal is in Luis's hometown in Mexico, and she says, people here think I'm very brave I'm in the country and I don't speak the language. How did she get there? Oh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, so Gladys Limon, who's the civil rights lawyer in the film, who's an amazing woman, unbelievable. Do you know her, Maria? Yes, and I was just, I just, I was on the board of Malda, I just finished my last board meeting, so uh, I'm very, very proud of the organization. Uh, That's just truly, uh, yeah, um, she's terrific. I mean, if, if it weren't for her, I don't think, any justice ever would have been found in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania. I think it would have actually probably been swept under the rug if it weren't for her actually not just seeing on the internet a piece about uh, Luis Ramirez having been beaten to death, but it was also in the piece that she read that it hadn't, it hadn't even been entered in the police log that night in the community. And she got on a plane and flew to Shenandoah um, by herself, um, and then called a press conference, and that kicked off a whole series of events, and, and then brought the case to the attention of, of Eric Holder in the U right. U.S. Attorney General's office. Um, so it was about Christmas time, so the event happened in July. Um, there had been charges, but the trial wouldn't actually be until the following April, and just before Christmas, um, I received a call from Gladys and she said, David, you're not gonna believe it. She said, Crystal feeling such a need for her children and for her to go and see Luis's mom, even though Gladys does, uh, excuse me, Crystal doesn't actually have a clue where they live, has gotten on a Greyhound bus has had, and has been traveling with her three kids on a Greyhound bus for four days and is somewhere deep in Mexico, going to try to find the mother. And I asked her to call the mother and ask if it would be all right if I flew to Mexico City and then drove to Iramico to, to try to be there when Crystal was there. And, and she called back and said, yeah, the mom would be really happy for you to come. And the mom actually found Crystal and the three kids standing at a bus stop in a village about an hour from where Iramico is. Um, but. Yeah. Uh, we have time for one more question, uh, but before recognizing the last question, I just want to especially thank everyone at the Center for Latin American Studies for putting this event together with such skill and such passion and enthusiasm. Yes, and this will be, our, unfortunately, our last question. But I will say we hope this is the beginning of a conversation 
and not the last time we are discussing with David Turnley this film and many other things. Yes. Uh, I want to thank you for the film. It was, uh, it was very powerful. I have a question, though, about the ending. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, bracket the film with two parades, and the ending parade, mm -hmm. the Martin Luther King Day, uh, is kind of, sort of the, the suggestion is that it's representing a transformation of some kind that's happened in the community, a potential for change, there's sort of a catharsis, a cleansing, and a desire for better mm -hmm. things. I'm just wondering whether that's a little bit uh, belied by the actual story, because there was nothing to suggest that the community itself had come to terms with what it had done. In fact, it was the work of the outside lawyer who had flown in, and it was the efforts of the federal law enforcement right. to basically take justice away from that community yeah. and to uh, impose uh, the, the uh, rule of law from outside. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you weren't uh, sort of trying to have it both ways as a filmmaker there. You know, legitimate question. Um, we certainly thought a lot about it and, and, um, and had to trust what I'm about to tell you in terms of the reasons why we made the decision. We had no interest the, from the very beginning that the, 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 the mission to try to make a meaningful film was always foremost in our minds. There was never an incentive and I worked with amazing editors and amazing executive producers to make this film. There was, in fact, hypersensitivity to not sugarcoat things. Um, so we certainly challenged ourselves to thinking about what, what the ending was doing. And we, we certainly didn't want it to sugarcoat things. We didn't want it to, to provide a sense of um, a clean, tidy ending. Um, however, the truth is that in a town like that, where there had never been a march on Martin Luther King Day. It was actually a couple of the football players, including the quarterback who organized that march. And yes, you are absolutely right. There were probably two or 300 people in that march, but it was two or 300 people in a town where that has never happened. And there has been since every year, apparently, um, a, 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 new, a different kind of event now that's happening. So let me just tell you something that, um, I'll close with this, if you wouldn't mind. Actually, and then I have one question for Maria. Just one question. <laughs> but I'll close with this. Um, we've shown this film now in about um, 10 different cities around the country. Um, we took this film back to Shenandoah three weeks ago. <laughs> and I was incredibly apprehensive. I, from the minute I started making this film, um, I always said to myself that what was important to me was that I be honest with people and that I not pull any punches about what I was trying to do. And what I understood from the get-go was that um, there would be a lot of people that wouldn't like me. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I could make a film where I could actually walk down Main Street and, and raise, keep my head high and look people in the eye. When, I, when we went back to show the film, having said all that, I was incredibly anxious. Um, and anxious in many respects, including my own, to some extent, my own safety, potentially. Um, we showed the film, and it was an audience bigger than this. It was a very large audience. Um, the first inkling that um, was very gratifying was just kind of the resonance of the applause. And then when the lights come, it came up, I just, I looked out at the audience, and it was really interesting because and I get very emotional when I talk to you about this. Um, it was a different response than I had ever seen in any audience in my life. It, was, it wasn't a congratulatory feeling. It wasn't, a, um, it wasn't an inquisitive feeling of challenging me as a filmmaker. It was, I saw people with open eyes looking me directly in the eye, and there weren't smiles on people's faces, but there was an openness in the faces. And I got up on stage and I said, um, I actually don't really want to take questions right now. I just want to hear from you people and, and you tell me what you think of the film. And um, the first woman who got up had been a woman who was writing on Facebook for the last three months all kinds of diatribe that this film was going to be horrible and it was going to open up wounds and it was going to be gratuitous and opportunistic and all kinds of things. 
And she got up and she said, I feel like I should be the first person to talk. I've been the person who's been writing the diatribe. And I'd like to say, first of all, thank you for making a film that is humanizing in a way that gives me the courage to try to be a better person. And then every single person that got up for the next 45 minutes said the same thing in different kinds of ways. So while I absolutely respect your question about the ending of the film, you know, if you think about it, change comes slow and it comes fast. We got a civil rights amendment in the United States of America in 1967. That's less, less than 50 years ago. We are in the midst right now of the Supreme Court actually taking a stand on gay marriage. We are in a place that only started actually within the last three months didn't even occur six months ago where people are talking about a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants in America. There is a lot happening right now that's really exciting. And I can promise you that there will be acts probably of, of prejudice in a place like Shenandoah forever and certainly probably in the very near future. But there are a lot of people in Shenandoah, Pennsylvania that will think twice before they ever get in a fight again and, and manifest what happened in that incident. And the, one, and the one question the one question I wanted to ask Maria um, to just sort of indulge her for maybe her fount of thoughts about the following was just what each of us as individuals can do about things like this. Well, I think, um, you know, it starts from the, so was, one of the things that struck me was so many of the immigrants, you showed them working, right, and really hard jobs. And uh, I think that uh, it's so easy for many of us to not consider how things come to be, right? Uh, whether it is the person who's you know, cleaning you know, a classroom or who comes in to clean in your office or who cleans you know, the restaurant. I mean, it's just we, it, that small recognition, and one of the lessons I always learned way back when, when I was um, a baby lawyer, was you needed to treat everybody very well, including the mailman, the person in the mailroom, because he, that person was someday going to have to, at, you know, at the last minute, take the papers down to the courthouse. And if you were dismissive and disrespectful, as I often saw my colleagues be, they weren't going to be responsive, right? But it, it really is that, that lesson of, of remembering that every single person is you know, worthy of respect and dignity. And I think that it is often um, so hard for us to put that in our, in our, as we go into our busy lives, right? And the other thing I would say is to be there, perhaps not as often in Berkeley, but I think uh, even here, there are conversations. Uh, and, and fears, and, and there are lots of fears about um, the economic situation in our country and globally. And to stop and actually think, the, what I would hope people like, who benefits from turning one group against another? Who benefits, right? When we're t going after immigrants or this whole, this like, excuse me, you've got working class whites and you've got these you know, undocumented immigrants working, clearly those mattress making jobs probably could be good paying jobs, except they're undocumented people who don't feel like they have a right to say something, right? Someone's benefiting. So asking, who benefits from dividing us? Mm -hmm. Which people are, you know, many of our leaders, unfortunately, are very quick to do at, at all levels of government. It's like, yeah. who benefits from that? And I think sometimes that might help us identify the true place where we need to do collective action. And I looked out at this group of young people over there and I want to actually, first of all, thank you guys for coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and back in, the, back in the early 60s when Dr. King and, and, and so many were marching through the Deep South and then as time evolved throughout America, fighting for civil rights, um, they called the people in those marches foot soldiers. And they were foot soldiers of nonviolence um, and striving for peace. And I would challenge each of you guys now to be the foot soldiers of tolerance and respect. And when you see, when you pe see people acting out in front of you, when you see people taking what is sort of the easy course, which is what we saw in this film of lashing out physically and 
and fighting, just walk away and get your friends to walk away and get people to think about what they're doing and realize that that's what being tough really is and be the foot soldiers of peace for the rest of us. And thank you for, for that. Yeah. Let me thank David Turnley and Maria Echeveste for the real sacrifice for being here.